Welcome, my name is Matt Bryce, and on behalf of the St. Helena Arrhythmia Center, thank you so much for joining our broadcast. Whether you're a patient seeking help or education on AFib and arrhythmia, or a medical professional seeking the same, I think you're gonna to find today's seminar very helpful to you. Today's broadcast is gonna cover our innovative treatment options, including our minimally invasive surgical options, which we'll be covering shortly. Dr. Gan Dunnington, our medical director and our cardiothoracic surgeon for the St. Helena Arrhythmia Center, leads our team and will provide the education for today's broadcast. A portion of the Adventist Heart Institute is dedicated to furthering the understanding and treatment of this disease through clinical trials, as well as serving as a primary education resource for both physicians and those suffering from AFib. Some patients come to us from our local community in St. Helena, most of which come to us from over two hours away. And as such, our institute is built as a destination medicine facility. In fact, as a patient, when you contact us, we partner you with a patient advisor and a nurse navigator, so that way every step of the way during your treatment, you're both well informed and well cared for. As we begin our education today, you're going to notice uh, some prompting below the player that you're currently watching this. Uh, we encourage you to submit those questions, to reach out to us, and to use us as your resource. We consider ourselves the help desk, if you will, for AFib and for arrhythmia. So again, use this time and use that prompting below the player to submit those questions and to reach out to us. Our patient advisors are currently standing by online and have committed to answering all the questions we receive during our broadcast within the next 24 hours. Uh, throughout this process, we encourage you to take lots of notes, to ask those questions you want the answers to, and really to get to know the non-surgical and minimally evasive surgical options available to you. And now, as we begin our education, watch what we've helped other patients get on their path to recovery for both their AFib and their arrhythmia. I was in AFib constantly since the time I was about 35. I was playing tennis and pushed it too far and went into AFib. He never looked like somebody who had a heart problem. I just felt bad. I, I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but it was an irregular heartbeat. All of a sudden you become much more tired, lightheaded, and I would always just think, I'm gonna try and push through it. Not knowing day to day what was going to happen, I don't think he realized how fragile he was. And having to think, now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna to have to have surgery. I'm gonna to have to have something to fix this. The electrical circuitry of the heart is fairly regular for everyone. AFib is just a series of short circuits that causes the muscle to all fire at the same time. So instead of a pumping, it fibrillates. Medicines only work to a certain point, and of course every procedure that you have incurs with it a certain level of complication possibility. In 1974, the first heart surgery in Northern California was performed at this site, and that legacy continues today with cutting-edge care. St. Helena Hospital has been a leader in cardiac services. If you have this condition or someone you care about does, you want them to have the best chance improving or curing this. We're the only place that assembles all the parts so that you can have the most comprehensive solution. There's something about Napa Valley, and there's something about St. Helena, this hospital, that you have that community feel with really high level service that you usually only see at a big university center. And so I saw all the pieces in place to be able to build a, a really incredible program. For me, the clock was ticking. And I'd say for about three or four years, things were going pretty well. But I reverted back to AFib. That was just very, very discouraging. My cardiologist said, well, there's a new procedure that, that's known as a hybrid ablation procedure. I was under the care of an electrophysiologist and was the one that started to share with me the different alternative procedure that could be be done. I asked him at the time, I said, yeah, but do you have anybody who can do that? And he said, we have this Dr. Dunnington who is excellent at this and it's his specialty. 
He was very natural. He spoke in layman's terms and explained things very well. I just had a feeling of confidence with him. It was exactly what I needed. After meeting with Dr. Dunnington, I had all the confidence in the world that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. The hybrid approach to AFib ablation basically is a hybrid of catheter ablation and surgical ablation. Basically, we do a small, minimally invasive operation with a thoracoscopic or port access. We follow that with a catheter procedure to uh, give us our best chance of cure. It's really increased the patient's overall success rates up in that 80-90% range. I just came out of there very happy and very confident that after all these years, something could be done. The minute that surgery was over and I woke up, it was fixed. I woke up and Lord, just tell me you're in rhythm. It's been amazing for me, a life-changing deal. Making a decision about a cardiac surgery procedure is really very major. When you meet Dr. Dunnington, you're immediately put at ease. He tells you that he can fix your problem and you just understand the procedure and have confidence that this is the right decision. We had made the right decision in going through with this procedure. Thank you, Dr. Dunnington. Thank you for giving me my husband back. How are you living now? Is this a way that you feel like you want to live? Knowing that there's a procedure that you can have that can get you back to feeling how you were before this came about. There are options for you. Many patients are anxious whenever they have to have anything done in the hospital. When our patients come to us here at St. Helena, they will be in the hands of an exceptionally well-trained team that has been assembled specifically so that we can have the best possible outcomes for our patients and for helping improve the quality of their life. Patients are coming to us from all over the West Coast and even internationally for this innovative care. There are only a handful of sites in the world where this procedure is offered. So many patients have been told, this is something you have to live with, but they're now finding out that there's hope and a cure, and St. Lena Hospital is offering that hope. Hello, my name is Gan Dunnington. I'm a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon up at St. Helena Hospital. I wanted to thank you all for uh, attending our webinar tonight where we're gonna be discussing uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's a problem, uh, really a big problem in this country, uh, whereas about 1% of the population suffers from it, so three to five million people. And in my estimation, very few are taken seriously. And often you've gone through many treatments, whether it's uh, shocks, medications, uh, maybe even had catheter ablations or, or other types of ablations in the past. And uh, uh, something that educates you, you know, what are all the options for you? Here we have, a, we have an AFib center uh, where we can treat it all from, from the smallest types of treatments or diagnose, diagnostic issues all the way up to uh, uh, the most intensive treatments for those that really have had AFib that's been intractable for a long, long time. So to start it off, I just wanted to give you a little introduction about who I am. And uh, here we have a map of the U.S. with, with what I think are all the uh, important icons that you should ever need to know about. But I started off in the, in the center of the universe, Richmond, Virginia, in case you guys didn't know that, and went down to Duke University for my undergraduate degree where I met my future bride who was actually a California girl from out in the Bay Area. Uh, so, so of course I followed her out where I taught high school for a year. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, Menlo Park area, and then why not move back to Virginia for, for medical school? I went to the Medical College of Virginia. It was at MCV fortuitously that I met a doctor who I currently am in, alliance, in an alliance with um, treating atrial fibrillation. Really, uh, 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 we've, we've brought together a bunch of centers that can treat AFib uh, it, with all forms of, uh, of ablation treatment from catheter to surgical to hybrid. And we're going to talk about all those possible treatments uh, tonight. Uh, 
After medical school, I moved back out to Stanford where I did my general surgery residency and why not one more trip across the country back to the University of Virginia, where also I was lucky really at the right place at the right time to, to learn about hybrid therapies where cardiologists and surgeons work together to treat atrial fibrillation, which may intuitively sound obvious to have that teamwork can help the system, but that's not always been the case in medicine. UVA uh, uh, really was one of the first centers in the country uh, working to uh, perfect minimally invasive uh, AFib treatments. After University of Virginia, I came back to Stanford where I was on faculty for a couple years. And after a couple years working there, I decided uh, to take my, my game up to where I am now, Napa and St. Helena, uh, where uh, frankly, I think we've put together an atrial fibrillation program uh, that is, uh, in my estimation, one of the best around. Uh, so what are we gonna talk about tonight? Basically everything about atrial fibrillation, and, but in the beginning we need to preface it with some basics. So what about anatomy 101? If we talk about the heart, uh, we think about muscle. Heart muscle, the muscle is the workhorse uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the organ. And as we, you all probably remember from, from high school and college, you have two atria, which are the upper chambers of the heart, and two ventricles, which are the lower chambers that actually do most of the uh, uh, work of beating the blood out to the lungs and to the body. Well, what else do we have? We have plumbing, so the blood vessels. When someone has a heart attack, usually that means one of those blood vessels has been uh, blocked up, and we have a whole set of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons that are intent on keeping the blood flowing through those vessels uh, through procedures like bypasses or stents. Well, what else do we have? There are valves that separate the chambers of the heart. Some of you have heard of mitral valve prolapse or aortic stenosis. Uh, these valves sit between the upper chambers and the lower chambers, as you can see on this diagram, and they really make sure that the blood all flows in one direction and not backwards. If the blood starts to leak backwards or the valve gets too tight, then there is strain on the heart, and strain on the heart can lead to atrial fibrillation. Now, most of what we're going to be talking about tonight deals with the electrical system or the conduction system of the heart, which is really just the, the wiring. Uh, here you see the natural pacemaker of the heart, the SA node, lives up here in the upper chamber of the heart, and the electrical current is supposed to pass through in an organized fashion to this gatekeeper, AV node of the heart, with the electrical current then going down to the lower chambers. And as long as that system is working well and uh, everything is well-timed, you have maximal efficiency of the heart. But when you go into atrial fibrillation, if you don't have that coordination, you start to lose some function and overall efficiency. So this is what atrial fibrillation, and this is what I'm talking about. If we have the normal conduction from the SA node through the AV node, that's how it's supposed to look. But what about if you get a whole bunch of short circuits where the, where the upper chambers of the heart, instead of beating, start to quiver? They quiver because that electrical current starts to cycle on itself. What happens is you lose something called your atrial kick. You don't have enough efficiency, and sometimes that can make you have some of the symptoms we have from atrial fibrillation, whether it's fatigue, shortness of breath, or maybe even some racing heartbeat. Well, here's the Mona Lisa. I like to think of this as a classic example of a normal sinus rhythm heart. It's safe, it's comfortable, we recognize it. This is a more modern piece, something like Jackson Pollock would paint. That's an atrial fibrillation piece. Now, what about this cat? What's not to like about a happy, smiling cat? This is a normal sinus rhythm cat. Here's your atrial fibrillation kitty. Distressed, maybe a little angry, uh, certainly chaotic on the inside. That could also look like an atrial fibrillation doctor. Well, here's a dance. Here's Fred and Ginger doing their two-step, looking perfectly in sync. This is how normal sinus rhythm would look. Now, some of you have seen Seinfeld before. Some of you have seen this, uh, this dance. This is much more chaotic. This is irregular. This is something that I would think is much more akin to uh, atrial fibrillation. It looks terrible. Nobody would want to dance like that. Look how scared everyone in the audience is. That's AFib. So joking aside, let's talk about what the heart actually looks like when it's beating. Here's a normal sinus rhythm heart, and you see the upper chambers of the heartbeat and then the lower chambers. That's the normal heartbeat. That's what it should look like. Well, in atrial fibrillation, just like I was saying, you see this quivering of the upper chambers, and then the lower chambers may go too fast, 
It can certainly go irregular and you lose so much efficiency that you, you're going to have some of those symptoms that we've talked about uh, or I briefly mentioned. What are those symptoms? There are a whole, there's a whole spectrum of symptoms you can have. It can be anywhere from palpitations, you feel like your heart's going to beat out of your chest. You can just have an uneven pulse. Some people are pretty is made worse the older you get or more common the older you get. And frankly, between men and women, women have a little bit tougher time with AFib. They have more strokes, they're more likely to have problems from their strokes with it, and it can be a little bit more challenging to treat. Now what are controllable risk factors? These are the ones that usually your doctors are, are getting on you about. These are the things that you have the power to stop and may actually help uh, slow down uh, the likelihood of, of, of progressing in your atrial fibrillation disease. Well, lung disease, certainly smoking falls into that, uh, is something that can be at least worked on. Uh, alcohol, uh, though I live in Napa Valley and, and wine is a plentiful, uh, we, we see that a lot of atrial fibrillation can be stimulated or exacerbated by alcohol use. Obesity, the heavier you are, the more obesity, the more likely you are to suffer from atrial fibrillation. And then obviously stimul stim excuse me, stimulant use, especially caffeine, as shown in this picture of this woman guzzling her coffee pot, uh, can often be a trigger to get people's atrial fibrillation going. Now, if you are listening to this and you have AFib, you probably have experienced some of these triggers. And if you haven't, maybe you should think about, you know, are these things that part of my life that maybe are, are, are something that's leading up to uh, uh, episodes that I'm having? So along with some of these things we've talked about, other you know, triggers or risk factors for atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure is probably the biggest. And a lot of people have high blood pressure, and even if it's controlled with medications, a lot of times uh, it's, it's hard to know what your blood pressure is at any given time. But we know high blood pressure can lead to atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease or previous heart attacks, uh, heart failure, uh, or problems with the valves, like I mentioned before. Any of those can, uh, can lead to development of atrial fibrillation. There are causes sometimes like infections or thyroid problems or certain medications uh, or stresses on the body that can lead to atrial fibrillation. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have AFib. And sometimes by treating those symptoms and those problems, you can actually take away your risk for having AFib without having to have any sort of major procedure for your AFib alone. With that said, what we say is AFib begets more AFib. So once you've been proven to have it, it we just know that you're a little bit more susceptible to it. Why should you do something about it? There's a couple reasons and we're going to talk about them a lot, but one of the most important reasons that we all fear uh, uh, when atrial fibrillation is a diagnosis is the stroke. Here's, a, here's a, uh, basically an example of what you would have as a, a patient that has their heart. There's a left atrial appendage, which is a little lesion that's, uh, excuse me, it's a little uh, sac that sits, sits off the heart where a clot can form and that clot can go up to the head and that's where the stroke comes from. So how do we diagnose this? Typically, if we get an EKG or a Holter monitor, that will give us the diagnosis. Echocardiography or ultrasounds of the heart are important to look at other exacerbating problems or is there a leaky valve that goes along with it? Or stress testing can be important to know, uh, is there coronary disease or something that basically the heart's unhappy about that's causing it to have atrial fibrillation? Now, something that's staggering to me is a lot of patients have atrial fibrillation and they're not even sure what type they have. There are, we've classified it, and it's a pretty, it's pretty broad base, but there's a first detected episode. That means you had it one time, it was self-limited, it went away, you've never had it again. Does that mean you have atrial fibrillation? It just means you had it once. It doesn't mean you necessarily need to do anything about it. Now, paroxysmal AFib comes and goes inside of seven days without any major interventions. This is a type that is very, very common and can be quite distressful, even though it's self-limited. Persistent AFib will last more than a week, more than seven days, or it's the type of AFib that if it was less than seven days, we had to shock you out of it, or uh, do a, you were, maybe you were hospitalized and had to be on medications to be fixed. And then long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, we used to call it permanent. Usually we don't call it permanent anymore. We only call it permanent or chronic AFib if we've made the decision that we're not going to treat it anymore. Once you've made the decision not to go for a rhythm control strategy and we're just going to keep the heart rate at rest, uh, we would call it a chronic at that stage. But long-standing persistent AFib patients are the ones that are the hardest to get back into normal sinus rhythm uh, without some more advanced techniques that we will talk about. 
Now, how do you decide what, what the best treatment options or what you should be, uh, how you should be treated for your atrial fibrillation? When we look at something called a CHADS-2 score, this is your stroke risk score if you have atrial fibrillation. The letters stand, as you can see on the slide, congestive heart failure, C, H for hypertension, age for, uh, A for age over 75, D for diabetes, and two points for stroke. You basically, if you have a score more than two, you, have to be, you should be anticoagulated. Your risk of stroke goes up considerably if your CHADS-2 score is greater than two. There's a newer version of this called a CHADS VASC, and you also get points if you're female, if your age is greater than 65, or if you have vascular disease. So all very important factors to think about when we're trying to decide, do you need to be on blood thinners for your atrial fibrillation? Now the blood thinners, and you've all heard of them, Coumadin or Warfarin has been the, has been the one that's been around for the longest time. But now we see Super Bowl ads, we see World Series commercials for the newer drugs, the Pradaxa, the Zeralto, or the Eliquis. These are drugs that are taking off because so many patients have atrial fibrillation and they need to be on blood thinners, but also because you don't need the monitoring that you do with Coumadin and it doesn't necessarily restrict your, your dietary needs. When we talk about atrial fibrillation, there are two ways to treat it, rate control or rhythm control, just like I said before. If you look at the slide, these are, this is slow AFib, where the rate is relatively slow, it's not too bad, and here's rapid AFib. If you're in rapid atrial fibrillation, your heart's not gonna last for a long time like that. You need to be rate controlled or rhythm controlled. If you're in slow atrial fibrillation, you can live like that. If you're asymptomatic, you don't have any fatigue, shortness of breath problems, that's okay, you don't have to do anything about it. But if it is causing symptoms, it's causing problems or the medications are causing problems, that's when we usually think about treatment options. Moving on to treatment options, there's medications, there's catheter ablation, there's surgical ablation, and then there's ultimately the hybrid maze, which I'll talk about a lot more uh, as we move forward. Okay, so now I think we're gonna talk about some interventional options. Now, I've gone over a lot of information in a very short period of time. And if you have questions, which I'm sure some of you do, don't be bashful. We're, we are here for education. That's the whole point of tonight is so you uh, uh, learn about atrial fibrillation, learn about uh, what we're trying to communicate to you, and we are here as a resource for you to be able to ask questions. So if you have questions, go into the website, ask the questions, we're certainly gonna have time uh, at the end to go over some more as well. So interventional treatment options for atrial fibrillation. I mentioned the classification and based on what classification of atrial fibrillation you have may determine what treatments, treatment options you take. But if we look at the options, you have drugs or ph pharmacologic therapy, you have cardioversion or the, the paddles, the shock, which we do with you sedated, so don't worry about that. We have surgery or an open maze procedure and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. There certainly is an ablate and pace strategy, which I think is probably farther down the line as far as, um, you know, you, it shouldn't be a primary option, but in, in that strategy, the AV node of the heart is ablated so that the con you can't go fast. This is a rate control strategy, and you're left having to have a pacemaker to make sure that your heartbeat can go fast enough for uh, uh, you to, to not be too symptomatic. And then catheter ablation, uh, RF ablation or cryoablation. RF meaning radio frequency, uh, which is just the type of energy source we use to burn lesions on the heart, or cryoablation, which is a deep freeze, which also can ablate or form scar tissue on the heart. So the re most recent guidelines for atrial fibrillation took a little bit of a stance from previous guidelines. It said that in some patients, ablation may be preferred over drug therapy. In the past, you would, you would have had to have failed a couple of uh, drug trials before we moved on to catheter ablation. But in certain patients, maybe in young, otherwise healthy patients that have many, many years to live uh, and aren't interested in being on lifelong uh, antiarrhythmic medications, catheter ablation can be chosen as a first-line therapy. Now, what are the medications? Many of you have tried a lot of the different medications, and they have names like flecainide, propafenone, sotalol, amiodarone, dofetilide. You've heard those drugs. Those are specifically there for controlling your rhythm. Multac or dronandarone is another one. 
Uh, the rate control agents really aren't trying to get you back into normal rhythm. They're just trying to control the rate so your heart doesn't race, but it will still stay irregular at a slower pace. Those are things like beta blockers, metoprolol, atenolol, carvedilol, or calcium channel blockers like diltiazem is the most common one, or digoxin uh, uh, can be drugs that we use to try to control your rate. And then finally, the anticoagulants, like I already mentioned, the Coumadin and the or warfarin and the novel anticoagulants, uh, the rivaroxaban, which is Xeralto, apixaban, which is Eliquis, or the dibicatran, which is Pradaxa. Now, this is a schematic that you might not understand. This is mostly for heart surgeons and uh, uh, electrophysiologist, but this is a cartoon drawing that depicts the maze procedure. Now, Jim Cox was a surgeon that came up with a maze procedure. In this picture, here's the SA node or the start point for the electrical current in the heart, and here's the finish, the AV node before the electrical current goes down into those lower chambers, the ventricles, and the blood gets beaten, uh, gets uh, uh, pushed off to the rest of the body. Well, depicted in red, are the burn lines or the freeze lines uh, or a surgical line that we would try to create to form a maze lesion set. The reason we try to draw those lines, the reason Jim Cox came up with the maze operation is the electrical current can't cross that scar, but it can still get to all the different parts of the heart. So even though we're blading, the electrical current still can get to all parts of the heart. The heart can still contract normally, but the electrical current won't short circuit on itself. It can't form a big circle and it'll go from start down to finish. Et voila, no more AFib. That's the concept. That's the, uh, that's the way you should think about it. The whole goal of a maze procedure is to have a start point, a finish point, and only one way for the electrical current to get through the heart so that it can't get short circuited or, or, or off track in short, short circuits. Now, what about a little bit of the history? I mentioned Jim Cox. He uh, worked uh, initially on this out of Duke University. You may remember that name. And then ultimately went to Washington University uh, in St. Louis, uh, where he was uh, uh, on faculty there for a long time. It was mid-80s that he did his first Cox maze operation, and that was an open chest, on pump, cut and sew procedure. Worked very, very well, but maximally invasive. Well, it wasn't until 1994, 15 years, 14 years later, uh, that the first catheter ablation happened. And then ultimately in 1997, when a cardiologist in the Bordeaux region came up with the notion that most of the triggers for atrial fibrillation reside in something called the pulmonary veins, or those veins that bring the blood from the lung back into the heart. Well, here's a schematic, and this is a, a, a 3D representation uh, like an electrophysiologist would see uh, from a, a CAT scan. Here's the back of the left atrium. Remember, that's on the left side of the heart, the upper chamber. Here's the left atrial appendage, and these are the pulmonary veins on either side. Well, what Dr. Hasegera realized is that, and let me go back here for one second, what Dr. Hasegera realized is that a lot of the triggers for atrial fibrillation start in these pulmonary veins, and if we can isolate those pulmonary veins, whether with cryo or radiofrequency ablation, then a lot of times the atrial fibrillation will be controlled, especially if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Well, what about, uh, you know, what does it look like to an electrophysiologist? Now I will freely admit I am a surgeon. I'm not as used to looking at squiggly lines as the electrophysiologists are, but they read these lines like the matrix, okay, they're very good. This, one of my electrophysiologists shows me this and he always tells me this is his favorite slide. Well, what we see here is basically a patient has been cardioverted and they're in normal rhythm until right here, you see in the right superior pulmonary vein, there's an extra beat. You don't see that beat anywhere else. And what did that do? It triggered the patient into an, irregu an irregular atrial fibrillation rhythm. It's a very interesting look at how AFib can get initiated by that trigger point in the pulmonary vein. Now, as I said, pulmonary vein isolation is really the cornerstone of AFib ablation. And what that means is you wanna to try to form those scars around those pulmonary veins. This is another look at it. If you look at this slide, this is uh, how it looks to the electrophysiologist when they're using their sophisticated mapping equipment. And each one of these red dots uh, basically represents a point where they have ablated the tissue. And if they can do an ablation uh, that encircles the pulmonary veins, they can render them silent, electrically silent, and hopefully stop the initiation of atrial fibrillation. 
Now that's radio frequency ablation. What about cryo ablation? Here's a uh, schematic from the company that makes the cryo device. The device is brought up through the groin into the heart. The balloon is inflated with very cold uh, nitric oxide, and then it is placed up against the os of the pulmonary veins, thus freezing a scar around the opening of the pulmonary veins, ablating it, forming scars so that the electrical current can't get from those veins back into the atrium. This is a little bit faster version of ablation. It works uh, quite well, and this is one of the newer technologies in the uh, catheter arena. Well, how good are these technologies? How good is this uh, uh, approach to atrial fibrillation? Well, if you have H paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that type that comes and goes and often is self-limited, it can be very effective. Now, you don't always get it on the first try, but if you're committing to two catheter ablations with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you can have upwards of 90% success. We define success as no more AFib and off the medications. With persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, the results aren't quite as good, with the best catheter bladers getting 70%, many getting lower, uh, somewhat like 60%. And with the long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation patients, you're still kind of lucky to get to 40% success rates after multiple ablations. Probably the single catheter ablation success rate in a long-standing persistent AFib patient is more like 25 to 30%. Okay, so now we've kind of gotten into my arena, the surgical options. Uh, this is what I do, and, and, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of things we, there are to talk about when it comes down to surgery for atrial fibrillation, but also just for any old regular heart surgery. In fact, this is a, a, a slide I put up uh, to, to basically, it's, it's difficult to see the graphics sometimes, uh, but the lines are representing different patients that have scored themselves physically and mentally in different uh, types of operations that we do on the heart, whether it's bypass operations, valves, uh, or atrial fibrillation. And what you see from the graph is that all the scores start relatively low and then they rise up. And what you see is that around six months, the improvements in overall quality of life tend to level off. So usually after all heart surgery, there's a steady uh, improvement through the three month mark, which is where I think you feel kind of about normal, but you then still continue to improve to the six month mark. Well, this is a study that was done out of Northwestern, and the part that really stood out to me is that the atrial fibrillation patient is the green uh, arrow, and these are patients that had open Cox maze operations, not even minimally invasive. They gave themselves the lowest grades physically and mentally of all these heart surgery patients, particularly on the mental side and they had the most improvement overall after the operation. So this really kind of struck me, and, 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 and it should strike you as inherently obvious as an atrial fibrillation patient, but it's a difficult disease to deal with. It's something that, uh, uh, like I said before, often is you know, really not valued as much as it should be as a problem. Another important point of this is I, you know, I go around the country talking to surgeons about treating atrial fibrillation when you go into the operating room. Unfortunately, only a quarter to a third of all patients that go into the operating room for other heart problems that have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation actually get their AFib treated. That means a whole pile of people are going in that have a golden opportunity to have their AFib treated with their other heart surgery and it's being ignored. So the plea I, I give to you and to all the surgeons I go try to talk to is if there's a patient, if you're a patient and you are told that you need to have your valve fixed, you need a bypass, you have an aortic condition and you have atrial fibrillation, make sure you have the AFib treated at surgery. Make sure you ask your surgeon, are you gonna treat my atrial fibrillation at the time of your other heart surgery? It does lead to fewer complications, fewer strokes, uh, less mortality, uh, there, there's every reason in the world to treat the atrial fibrillation just as much as you would any other disease coronary artery that you were going to put a bypass on or a valve that you were going to replace. So that's my general plug for heart surgery in general. But what about atrial fibrillation specifically? Now we've gone through the pathophysiology of it and we've talked about the irregular rhythm and the racing heartbeat. But why do we care necessarily about the atrial fibrillation? Well, it's the most common chronic arrhythmia in the United States. You have a higher mortality with it. You have a higher stroke rate with it. You have more congestive heart failure. 
like I said, it should be in bold, you have impaired quality of life. This is the thing that drives most patients to me for their AFib. And obviously for the, for the government or for insurance companies, it's a costly disease. If you have AFib, you very often can be in and out of the hospital, whether it's with racing heartbeat, congestive heart failure symptoms, or problems with the medications that you're taking to treat it. Now, what about strokes from AFib? 15% of all strokes are thought to be due to atrial fibrillation. A quarter of strokes in the elderly are due to AFib, which means it gets worse as you get older. And then strokes from AFib tend to be more disabling than strokes from other causes, more likely to land you in a nursing home or maybe even be lethal. 90% of cardiac emboli, meaning clots that come from the heart, come from the left atrial appendage, a structure we'll talk a little bit more about, but a structure that we've pointed out on the heart can harbor uh, those clots and in valvular disease a little bit less. Now, what about anticoagulation, considering all of these risks? Well, only half of patients who should be anticoagulated are actually treated. Of those that are treated, in large studies where we're taking great care to make sure that you're on the right doses, you're only in the right therapeutic range a half to two-thirds of the time. So with that, there's a 3 to 5% risk per year of having a major bleeding episode on Coumadin, and very similar for the novel anticoagulants, and as high as 13% risk per year once you get over 80 of having a major bleed. Even on anticoagulants, there's a 2 to 3% risk of having an embolic event, and that may just be because you're not in that range of therapeutic benefit uh, of the drug. Certainly that risk is a lot lower than if you weren't on anticoagulation. So there's a lot of balance. I say here that the newer drugs aren't any better, Berdaxa, Zeralto, or Eliquis, well, they are better. You don't have to modify your diet. You don't have to get the testing. Often they can be, uh, uh, you know, just uh, once a day drug. But they're not any better in terms of your overall risk of having a, a bleed or an embolic event with atrial fibrillation. They're equal. So we have a big problem. Now here's a study that was done locally by a very good group of catheter ablators, a very good group of electrophysiologists, and it looks at your success rates of catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. This is all comers. Now, on the slide, you see a red line. This is your paroxysmal atrial fibrillation group. Green is persistent, blue is long-standing persistent. And what you see is uh, uh, after a single catheter ablation, the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients have maybe a 50 or 60% success rates with the persistent and the long-standing persistent significantly lower. You see that blue line, the long-standing persistent patients have maybe a 30% uh, uh, success rate of being in sinus rhythm after a single ablation. But if you repeat that ablation, you have very high success rates for the catheter, for, excuse me, for the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the red line at the top, up to 80 or 90% success rates. But for those persistence and their long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation patients, whether you get ablated two, three, four, or five times, it's very difficult for anyone in the world to, get, to take catheter ablation for those difficult AFib patients and have better than 60, maybe 70% success rates. Another slide, another thing that they noticed out of that study is that women uh, who are in blue and men are in red on this uh, 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 graph, uh, women are more difficult to treat. They are harder to get in sinus rhythm. And as I said before, women typically tend to have more strokes and more disabling strokes from their atrial fibrillation. Now the uh, conclusion from, this, from the authors of this paper was that basically before you undergo catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, you should be told that you might have to have a second procedure. Definitely, anytime I tell someone you should go for catheter ablation, I say, but expect to have to have a second one. What the paper did not mention, and something that I'm here to kind of help promote educate as a surgeon, uh, is that there are also surgical options. And some patients say, I never want to have surgery no matter what. Other patients say, I just want to be fixed, and let's just make it as fast as possible and have it a one-time deal. So, you know, I think the long and short of it is, if you have atrial fibrillation, you should know all of your options. Well, I am a surgeon, and in surgical residency, we learn a lot of, uh, of uh, phrases, dogma, things that allow us to get through the day when we know that we are chronically assaulting people on a regular basis. Uh, one of them is, is no pain, no gain. You've all heard that before. To cut is to cure. Does anyone know that one? How about this one? When in doubt, cut it out. And then my favorite one, nothing heals like cold, hard steel. The truth is, 
nobody wants surgery. <laughs> That's the one that we don't necessarily learn, but the reality is, is that nobody would go to surgery unless it actually worked. Patients come to surgery because we have good outcomes, uh, because you do recover, uh, and if it didn't work, nobody would ever go to surgery. So nobody wants surgery, but nobody wants to struggle, suffer, or die either. And so it's good that we have an option that we can give. Well, who is the right patient for surgery? That's the real question. What are the indications? Well, if you have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, and I'm gonna stress this again, and you already have to go in for heart surgery, you already need a bypass or a valve, you should have an open maze operation at the time of that heart surgery. Let's say you're a young patient, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you have decades to live. You don't wanna be on long, long-term anticoagulation, you might consider a surgical option because catheter options don't necessarily treat that left atrial appendage. If you have a contraindication to anticoagulation, you can't take blood thinners because you've had a head bleed, you have bleeding ulcers, you have some reason you can't take blood thinners, that's probably leans you towards a surgical approach. If you've been on blood thinners and, thinners and still are sending clots, that's an indication. Certainly if you have failed multiple catheter ablations, that's a great indication to consider a surgical approach. If there's a contraindication to catheter ablation, which doesn't really exist much, sometimes people's anatomy is such that you can't have a catheter ablation, that's pretty un unusual. But the last one I think is a very important one, that's if you're high risk to fail a catheter ablation. Like I said before, if you have had AFib for more than a year, or your left atrium, that upper chamber of the heart, has gotten significantly enlarged, your chance of success with a catheter ablation is very, very low. And so, that, so you know, is it worth it to you or is it worth it to the doctor to put you at even a small risk to try something that we know is not likely to succeed? Well, here's some slides that basically show a full open Cox Maze 4 operation. You might notice these slides are black and white because this is an old black and white operation. We don't do a whole lot of cut and sew maze operations anymore, but in this first picture, this is what it looks like when we're looking at the heart with all the cannulas in and the open chest, and we open up the atrium, and we extend these incisions, and ultimately we sew them all back together, and you have this Frankenstein heart with a lot of suture lines. Well, we made it a lot easier. Several years ago, energy devices came up, so instead of having to cut and sew, we can just burn these lines on the heart, you don't have, as obviously, as much risk for bleeding. And Ralph Damiano, who is a major uh, disciple of Jim Cox, uh, reported this out of Washington University, looking at open maze operations. And he had 90% success rate, normal rhythm at 12 months. 80% of them didn't need any blood thinners. And that was with very rigorous, rigorous follow-up, meaning you were wearing a Holter monitor at 3, 6, 12 months. Um, you know, this is the, probably the best data that we have outside of Jim Cox's data initially. Unfortunately, his data didn't have as good a follow-up. Well, the hybrid maze operation, like I said, is a combination of surgical and catheter ablation. The reason we invented it, or the reason it was invented, I can't say that I invented it, but the reason it was invented was so that we could do a full maze operation without having to open the chest. <coughs> Here you see on the slide a picture of a fancy instrument with a light on the tip. This allows us to get back behind the pulmonary veins. Getting behind the pulmonary veins is one of the trickiest parts of heart surgery. If we can get behind the pulmonary veins, we can use a little red rubber catheter to guide our ablation instrument. The ablation instrument is just this clamp. It's a bipolar radiofrequency ablation energy. We can clamp down on the tissues, and as you can see in the cartoon, we can burn a line right across the atrium. We don't have to cut the veins off and sew them back up. We just burn the line. When we take the clamp off, we have a nice circle that electrically isolates the pulmonary veins. That line right there was created in probably about two minutes. That would often take up to two hours in a cath lab. <laughs> These other instruments similarly do radiofrequency ablation and allow us to put all of the lesions on the heart that you would do with an open cut and sew maze minus about 5%. Where's that last 5% gonna come in? I'll tell you very shortly. But the last part of the surgical procedure, through again, minimally invasive approach, is to get rid of this left atrial appendage. This is that sac where those, that's the stroke center of the heart, where the clots form and we can clip it off. So here at the end of the surgical part of the case, 
you have these lines that have been burned onto the heart, preventing short circuiting. Remember that schematic I showed you of the maze? And we have most of the maze completed. Now there are two little areas on the inside of the heart that we can't get to from the outside. They're called the flutter lines. Atrial flutter is like a cousin rhythm to atrial fibrillation. In this depiction, the cardiologist has come up through the groin, and here with this catheter, they're doing the right atrial flutter burn line. It's called the cavo tricuspid line. And then they're testing. And the, the EP equipment, electrophysiology equipment, is very, very good at testing. In this depiction, they're testing my pulmonary vein isolation line here and here. They're sending electrical signals out and it's not getting out. Although it seems hard to believe, every now and then I do have a little break in my line. As you see in this cartoon, in that particular instance, what you would be able to do would be spot weld a small leak in the ablation line. And that's really what the EP equipment is best at. Spot welding, small ablations, not necessarily long linear ablations. <coughs> Excuse me. And here you see at the end, uh, finishing off the ablation so we have a full maze uh, operation done. Uh, my part of the operation, so this is a two-part procedure obviously. My part is the surgical and is followed by a catheter ablation. My part is done through patients, physicians, supine, general anesthesia. It takes about two hours. This is where the ports go. Typically I will use four, uh, uh, three five millimeter ports and one 12 millimeter port on each side of the chest. Now what about that left atrial appendage? There's, a, there's a, a paper, not the greatest paper, but it has a great title. The left atrial appendage, our most lethal human attachment. That just alludes to the fact uh, that many people have strokes from the left atrial appendage. Well, if you look at this, this is an AFib left atrial appendage. This is a normal left atrial appendage. You notice the difference? The AFib one's a little stretched out. There's a little bit more room for larger clots to form. Uh, basically, we have some evidence that if you put an umbrella device inside that appendage, you reduce your stroke risk to the same as if you were on blood thinners. Uh, and so it just makes sense. If you get rid of the stroke center, you'll probably have fewer strokes. Well, what's it look like? This is a clip. It's called an atrial clip. This is what I put on in my operations, and I put it on on all my open operations. But it's basically just two titanium bars, nitinol springs at the end, polyester covering, and that just cinches down at the base of the appendage. Here's another uh, cartoon to kind of show, similarly to what we just saw in the last video, uh, of a clip, and this is more, more depicts what the real clip looks like. The clip slides over the base of this left atrial appendage in slow motion in this case. And here we'd be looking from the inside of the heart out towards the appendage. And as the appendage closes down, what you'll see is that cul-de-sac goes away. The blood now cannot go out into the appendage. It is isolated off and you can't have a stroke there anymore. Well, what's it look like in real life? Avert your eyes if you don't want to see the blood and guts. But this is a real picture of, an, of a clip being put onto the appendage. We put the clip in position. We use basically an advanced Q-tip just to milk that appendage into the clip. And just like on the cartoon, you see that nice little appendage. This procedure itself, this part of the procedure doesn't take me more than say five minutes. In fact, we're part of a study, a trial right now, a stroke trial at St. Helena Hospital looking at just isolated left atrial appendage ligation. We know that a certain amount of AFib does come from the left atrial appendage and getting rid of it may help reduce that uh, AFib burden. We also are very, you know, we're pretty confident that if you get rid of the left atrial appendage, your stroke risk is decreased. So if you're one of those people that cannot take blood thinners, but you have atrial fibrillation or at high risk to have a stroke, Sometimes just an option like this, getting rid of the appendage, can be a very good option uh, uh, for someone like you that's kind of between a rock and a hard place. Well, after time, this is looking at the inside of the atrium on a, on a dog model. You see a nice smooth wall, and you can see how clots wouldn't be able to form uh, on the inside wall of that heart like they would with a, if you had a left atrial appendage intact. 
So let's say you've decided, okay, I think I'm the type of person that may need a hybrid maze procedure. I, I've had long-standing persistent AFib or I failed catheter ablation. What am I going to need to do before? Well, we need to know you have AFib. We need some sort of EKG or a, or a Holter monitor or something that kind of confirms it. Sometimes people will come to me and just say, oh, I just feel my heart skip a beat every now and then. Well, this isn't the procedure for that. But if you have real AFib, uh, you might be a candidate. We need to have an echocardiogram. Like I said, if the valves are messed up, sometimes the valves need to be fixed. If the valves are normal and this is just an isolated or primary atrial fibrillation issue, we can deal with it that way. We need to do a CAT scan of the chest just to make sure the general anatomy is okay. And we need a stress test to make sure that the coronaries are clean. Now, who can't have a hybrid maze? I used to say that if someone had had previous heart surgery, that was a contraindication, but I've backed off that because now I've done about 10 or 15 patients that have had previous heart surgery and they've all gone, all gone very well. But that's a very individualized approach. If you've had previous heart surgery, we would need to talk about it. I need to know what the operation was, how long ago it was. There are some details. So really the only major contraindication to having this procedure is your physical fitness. If you are in a wheelchair, you know, in a nursing home, then no, we probably can't do this operation on you. I tend to say, if you're healthy enough from walk, to walk from your car to my office, usually then you can tolerate the procedure and, and hopefully stand something to gain. Now what about catheter versus surgical ablation? I said a lot about this. If I had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that type that comes and goes on its own, is pretty easy to, easy to fix, I would get a catheter ablation myself. I mean, there's no reason to, to, to treat something with a sledgehammer if just a soft tap with a hammer will, will, will get the job done. Now, if you have non-paroxysmal AFib, meaning that AFib that has needed much more treatments, then I think a surgical approach is better. And, and frankly, if you can have a surgical approach, almost everybody that can have a surgical approach usually can have a hybrid approach, which is going to get you your, to your best success rates. So why do we want to fix AFib from the beginning? The main reason is the ones that we've talked about. Get you into normal rhythm, stop you from having congestive heart failure, get off the antiarrhythmic medications that often cause you to feel miserable, and hopefully decrease your, your hospitalizations and your shortness of breath and fatigue. Number two is reduce, reduce your stroke risk. Get off the blood thinners, reduce your chance of having that disabling stroke that really uh, could permanently affect your life. And, and, and that takes me to my third is better quality of life. The majority of patients that come to me aren't coming because they've had a major stroke. They're not coming because they've been in the hospital a hundred times. They're coming because they know that their life is not as good as it could be uh, as long as they're in atrial fibrillation. They want to get their life back. Now here's a quote. I put it up here because I get these from my atrial fibrillation patients more than any other type of patients that I operate on. And I remember I do bypasses and valves and aortas and everything. My AFib patients are my happiest patients. I, I tend to give all my patients full access to me so we have full communication. But here's a, patient, here's a, a note I got from a patient just recently. He tells me, as I've reached the third month mark since my operations, I wanted to confirm your promise to me that I will not believe how good I'll feel at this time. It's true, I'm more energized, I have higher spirits than I've had in years. It's as if you've turned the clock back by a good 20 years. I feel great. More importantly, I have an overall sense of well-being, which I'm not sure that I've ever experienced before. So these are the messages that I, I get on, on a somewhat regular basis. I, I almost verbatim have had five to ten of these messages in the last year and a half. This is why I love treating patients with atrial fibrillation. I think they feel so much better. I think they're so appreciative because they just uh, uh, they get their life back. So, so that's what I'm, I'm here to do, is to try to educate people about atrial fibrillation, about all your treatment options. You shouldn't go in just knowing about some things and not the other. The biggest treatment isn't necessarily appropriate for everyone. The smallest treatment definitely is not appropriate for everyone. And so I'm hoping I've been able to kind of shed some light on maybe what the best treatment for you could be. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining our broadcast. I hope you found the information Dr. Dunnington provided helpful and empowering, uh, whether you're seeking information on AFib or arrhythmia. Uh, we got a lot of questions during our broadcast, and the top three questions we received, the first one is, 
do you take insurance? And the answer is yes. We take most major forms of insurance. We also take Medicare. But more importantly, when you reach out to our institute as a patient, we hand walk you through your insurance and make sure that you're well informed throughout the entire process. The second question we receive is, I know you're in St. Helena, but do you service folks outside your region? And the answer is yes. We actually service folks uh, beyond our region. In fact, most of our patients come to us from over two hours away. And as such, our institute is built as a destination medicine facility. As a patient, you'll be partnered with a nurse navigator and a patient advisor every step of the way to make sure that you're comfortable and you're well informed throughout your treatment plan. The third question we receive is, when's the right time to seek help? I think the time is now. In fact, if you haven't done so, below the player, you're going to find some prompting where you can reach out to us, whether you can ask, uh, ask us a question or even uh, for, uh, gain more information regarding our institute. Uh, so again, if you haven't done so, use the prompting below the player, submit your information. Our nurse navigators are standing by online and have committed to answering all the questions we received during the broadcast today within the next 24 hours. As we wind down our broadcast today, our website is here for you with more information. In fact, our 800 number is also featured there. So if you haven't had a chance to reach out to us through the broadcast today, uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe even the next day, reach out to us by phone. We stand by ready to help you. On behalf of the St. Lena Arrhythmia Center, thank you so much for joining our broadcast. We wish you a great day.